Good afternoon and a warm welcome to everyone on this PA day as we start a new school year, a new school year that we are poised to enter with renewed hope and optimism, acknowledging and building on the struggles and the deep disparities that have been exacerbated during this pandemic. As we recommit to continuing our work as a board to building inclusive and welcoming learning environments for all, it's our hope that today's presentation on culturally responsive and relevant pedagogy will strengthen this stage for all students to achieve, believe, and belong. I'm Sita Jayaraman, Senior Manager, Human Rights and Equity with Halton Catholic, and I look forward to providing an overview of today's presentation. But before we do that, um, I'd like to begin by honoring the land and territory we're on. I'd like us to take a moment and reflect on the genocide of over 1,700 little souls in residential schools in various parts of the country. In keeping with the spirit of the 94 calls to action in the TRC, and as we begin this new school year, it's important for us to ask ourselves how each of us is implicated in the continued decimation of Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous culture, Indigenous voice of students, families and communities whether it's curricular erasure, streaming, overrepresentation and suspensions, overrepresentation in child welfare, how do we decolonize to refocus on indigenous excellence in education? How do we go beyond performative actions to embed indigenous pedagogy and voice in science, math, arts, and literature? I leave you with these questions as we think of the many nations that have thrived on these lands from the Anishinaabe to the Atawandron to the Haudenosaunee and the Métis. I ask you to take a moment to think about how we can build on the robust knowledge systems that have existed on this land for many, many centuries. I'd like to now invite uh, Jeff Kroll, Superintendent of Education Curriculum Services to lead us in prayer. Hello everyone, I hope this finds you well and you've had a restful and relaxing summer break. On behalf of senior administration, we'd like to welcome you back for the start of another school year. We certainly acknowledge that this has been a tough year. We witnessed and felt a lot of pain in the uncovering of the bodies of indigenous children across Canada, the killing of the Abzali family in London, the recent earthquake in Haiti, the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan, if only to name a few. At this time, I'd ask that you please take a moment to center yourself and keep the global community in your thoughts and please join me in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, you gather us together so that in the prayer of our daily lives, we learn how to be allies, build relationships, and accompany. We pray for when we have turned a blind eye to the injustice and inequality in our community and with our brothers and sisters. You call us to love as your Son, Jesus Christ, loved. You call us to enter into relationships here today so that we might better encourage one another to be champions for one another, May we learn to be culturally responsive and ultimately be moved to action. Guide our way to truth and justice and equality. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much, uh, Jeff, for leading us in prayer today. Uh, and now uh, it's my pleasure to share a little bit about uh, the presentation and introduce our two amazing presenters to you. So today's session is designed to help us develop and deepen our understanding of culturally responsive and relevant pedagogy, or CRRP, as a framework for removing barriers and increasing student engagement, well-being, and academic achievement. CRRP aligns with the board's commitment to supporting all students to achieve believe and belong, and the board's equity and inclusive education policy. Today's presentation will allow participants to develop classroom and school-based applications for student engagement and achievement through CRRP. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to our presenters, Alison Game San Vicente and uh, Ramon San Vicente. So Alison uh, works to disrupt educational practices that continue to disadvantage historically marginalized underserved students. Her passion for equity and justice has led to a secondment at York University's Faculty of Education. Congratulations to Alison on, her rec on recently becoming a superintendent at Toronto District School Board. She's the recipient of the Queen Diamond Jubilee Award and an author of Our Schools, Ourselves, Community Watch, Marginal at Best, a narrative on streaming in public education. 
and many other publications, including her latest publication, Schooling for Equity During and Beyond COVID. Welcome to you, Alison. Uh, Ramon, Ramon San Vicente is currently a principal with the Toronto District School Board. Uh, he's an educational activist and author of various texts, including Rhymes to Re-Education, a hip hop curriculum. Previously an instructional leader with Equitable and Inclusive Schools in TDSB, course director, York University's Faculty of Education. His work for, focuses on challenging systems of oppression in education and exploring new possibilities for equitable schooling. He's passionate about continuing to learn, unlearn, creating spaces for youth culture in public education and collaborating with, with others who disrupt oppressive practices in schools. Please join me in welcoming Alison and Ramon uh, to our uh, PA day today. And I'm going to stop presenting my um, PowerPoint and request uh, Ramon to present, to share his screen. And over to you, Ramon and Alison. Greetings, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for having us and thank you for uh, a wonderful way to start the session uh, today with some important reminders, uh, Sita and also Jeff for setting the context with the prayer um, and reminding us around our commitment to justice and, and allyship. Um, and what I took from you, Sita, was just, you know, the focus on the possibilities. While we will be real in our conversation today about the problems and the challenges, uh, we are also going to, I think, um, hopefully excite each other with the possibilities uh, with education. And, and as, as we're here in, in Halton Catholic District School Board, I'm reminded of, of my own uh, schooling, not too far from where you're at, uh, as I attended high school in Hamilton at one of the uh, Catholic high schools over there. Um, and it was, you know, while, while there were some challenges with the experience, just, you know, being one of just a few black students at the school and really struggling to find my my place of a, inclusion there were just a few teachers who opened up possibilities mm -hmm. uh, for me and and actually you know I, it gave me an opportunity to to uh, present with the mayor and and to to do some anti-black racism work uh, in Hamilton and that was the start of a of, of a lifelong commitment to advocacy to equity work uh, in education. So um, I'm really excited to, to learn along and with everybody here today. So thank you for having us. I'm gonna pass it over to Allison, who's gonna start us off today. Thank you so much, Ramon. And as Ramon has already indicated, we are both really happy and blessed to be supporting the important work in your board. So thank you both to Jeff and to Sita for that, that wonderful welcome. We've always been excited to connect with Sita and hear about the work and the passion that resides with so many of you to do what is necessary. I was also happy to hear in the prayer from Jeff how important global citizenship is, as well as justice and the, the relationship between the two. So uh, thank you. As Ramon has said, um, we have very much been involved in this work for many, many years as a pathway to build true inclusion and real engagement. We have learned so much in terms of the efficacy of solid teaching practices to eliminate achievement gaps. So we're happy to be here and we'll move into our collective agreements of what the session will look like for the next 75 minutes. So on the slide in front of you, you will see a number of nuggets. And this is from a book by Sensoy and D'Angelo that many of you may have had the opportunity to take a look at. It is called Is Everyone Really Equal? If you haven't had an opportunity, I encourage you to take a look at this text. I'm just going to give you a minute to read the nuggets in front of you. There's seven nuggets, and what I would ask is that you think of one that is relatively easy for you to do. You're like, yeah, I got that. And one that might be a little more challenging. So I'm just gonna allow you to read for a moment. Thank you. I know for me personally, 
sometimes the toughest thing is to stay engaged, and that's the very last nugget. And I say that because when that phone goes off or something happens down the hall, we, we want to respond. And we're asking you for as much as possible to stay fully engaged in the conversation. I know something that's really easy for me is actually the first nugget. I love to push myself intellectually, but to engage in, in, in this with humility as a learner. And we ask you to think about yourselves today as learners engaging in this work. The other nuggets, have, if, you, have, if you need, take a moment, go through them again. You may want to think about opinion and personal anecdotes, that's the second nugget, in terms of understanding the difference between. You may want to think more about what's your learning edge and push it further. We're going to move into the next slide, which also helps us position how we want to engage in this moment. I'm going to ask Ramon to flip to the next slide. Thank you, Ramon. So this, this next slide is about brave spaces. And that might be something you've heard about or not. Many boards have talked about safe spaces. But we don't want to think about the next 75 minutes as safe. We want to think about it as brave. The notion of brave spaces comes from an article. And the article was actually written to support conversations about diversity and about justice. And in this article, they actually were reflective of something called the power walk, an activity that many of us may have engaged in, and that many people's reflection was that they didn't feel safe. So rather, the authors have indicated, instead of safety, what we might need in this moment as we have these conversations is bravery. I'm going to give you a moment to read the quote on the slide. Now, I'm a bit of a speed reader, so administrators or whoever is organizing the, um, the recording, feel free to pause whenever you need to. What we wanted to point out on this slide is that we all have a philosophy. We all have a belief system. All of us, whether we've articulated it or not, have a perspective on culturally relevant pedagogy, on equity. Do we agree with it? Don't we agree with it? And what we're asking you to do in a brave space is to be okay with challenging a former condition or something that, that you've always believed in favor of a new way of thinking about things. This is how we learn, getting into that cognitive dissonance space where something doesn't quite make sense. That's how we build new knowledge and we're asking you to consider that space today, bravery, rather than the illusion of safety. In order for us to really get into the work of equity, the work of culturally relevant pedagogy and position why, exploring identities is important so that you can better understand who you are with respect to who your students are and why this work of culture and culturally relevant pedagogy is so important. So you will have been provided with a placemat by your principal. If you haven't, once again, you hit that magic pause button and make those copies. And on your placemat, you will see an activity, the first activity. And as I mentioned, anytime we engage in work that builds inclusion, it really requires us to think about our own identities, social identities, and reflect on how we see ourselves and how others see us. So in this activity, this takes three to five minutes, and you can participate in naming three of your social identities, which you feel have a significant impact on your experience in society. 
feel free to use some of the categories that you will see listed on the placemat. And many of you will recognize those are the protected grounds from human rights. Besides each of these identities listed, please record or write down if you feel you saw those identities reflected in your school curriculum. So we will ask you to pause the video for the next three to five minutes to give staff an opportunity to engage in this task. Thank you so much, and we hope that you had some time to really engage and record some of your identity and to write if you saw them reflected. We wanted to just put in the space, sometimes thinking about those identities and whether your identities were actually included in the curriculum. It can be challenging. It can sometimes bring up feelings, different feelings that you dealt with or grappled with as a young learner. So if at any point you feel the need to step out of the space, take a breather, let your administrator know, and come back in, that's completely acceptable and, and understandable. So one of the things we wanted you to think about as you engage in this activity was pretty quickly you probably recognize if your identity was included. As somebody who, is bo who has both uh, Black as well as South Asian ancestry, it would have been very quick for me to write race, and no, I didn't see that. What's also important for us to think about and provoke as we continue to move through this exploration of identity is that some identities privilege us and society more than others. Some provide us automatic privilege. Automatic privilege means we didn't earn it, we didn't do anything to get it, we just have this automatic privilege. And as we move through the rest of this presentation of professional learning, we will have an opportunity to dig a little bit deeper into the notion of power and privilege and who has it, who doesn't, and the implications in every classroom in the province of Ontario. Thank you, Alison. And I would just add to that, that when we think about identities, we also think about some different characteristics. The fact that some of these identities would be very dominant in our experiences, either growing up or as an adult. Uh, perhaps visibility plays a role in how dominant uh, an, ex an identity is in our experiences. Some of them uh, might fluctuate depending on situation and scenario and context. Um, so we, when we think about identities, and of course we talk about, we're gonna talk more about intersectionality and the fact that these identities don't exist on islands by themselves, that they intersect in different ways to play out in terms of our daily experiences. So uh, we're looking forward to, uh, this is the foundation for us in terms of uh, thinking about identity and then thinking about the provocation, which you'll see as the first provocation on your placemat, which is uh, who am I, uh, who are my students, and what does this all mean for teaching and learning? We're going to go to the next slide. Thank you, Ramon. We're just going to go through what we hope to accomplish in the next 75 minutes. Now, there are a couple moments where we will indicate this section. There, there are activities we're not actually going to do, but we put them in there just in case some schools wanted an extension activity. So there will be two times where there's an additional 10 minutes that we will let you know you don't need to engage in this unless you have additional time that you would like to commit to it. We know all staff are different. You've all done different types of learning. So for some of you, you might choose to, instead of have a 75 minute spot go a little bit longer, given your context and your staff. So you will see in the agenda, we are looking at some very specific provocations, questions we want you to think about, and questions we would like you to interrogate. The first provocation, who am I? And we began to answer that question in our identity activity. Who are my students? Is where we would like you to begin to move. And what does this have to do with teaching and learning? We hope to answer that question for you today. What do I know and believe about 
This is a really big question. All of us have been schooled in some way, maybe not here, but all of us are part of, of teaching in the province of Ontario. Some of you are teachers, others are educational assistants, you may be a CYC, we're all educators. We, we all interact with students with the goal of student learning. So the question that we want you to think about is what do we know about schooling? And we have a few activities to provoke some thinking about schooling. We also have an opportunity for you to think about some terminology, equality, equity, Eurocentrism, dominant group and discrimination. You see, Ramon wanted to see if I remembered, and I remembered the term. So we will not go into detail in this section. This is one of those sections that you may want to interrogate further with your staff as a school, as a community of learners, if needed. The next one, what do I know and understand about culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy? Some of you have heard of this before. Some of you have done a lot of work around this before. And for some of you, it might be very new. What we ask you to do is to think back to the, the norms that we set and find your learning edge. Wherever you are, push yourself further. And the final provocation, which we think is what we really hope everyone to spend some time and really get into. To us, this is the action piece. This is what will make the difference in classrooms and schools, is what action can I take to implement culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy in my role? It doesn't matter what your role is. So regardless of your role, whether you're the administrator in the building, whether you're a CYC, an educational assistant, the teacher, it doesn't matter. I know for some schools you might have different supervisors, the lunchroom supervisor as part of your staff professional learning. This is a conversation for everyone. So from your role and your space, how will you operationalize culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy? So we wanted to spend a little bit of time setting the context. And the provocation for you to think about in this moment is what do you know and believe about schooling? You will see in front of you what have provincial trends told us. We were very intentional about putting this particular set of data in the slide deck for you. And it might be a report that many of you are familiar with. It's called Unlocking Student Potential, and it was released in 2017. It was actually produced as a partnership between York University and the Ministry of Education. Their findings confirmed what many boards and the discourse has suggested for a long time, but not just for urban school boards, for the entire province. So this is data that all of us need to pay attention to. And this quote is taken right from the document, which is among the many issues facing the field of education, research demonstrates several critical areas of concern that demand attention in order to address issues of educational equity. Streaming, a conversation I imagine all of you had, um, have, are having as a board, given streaming takes place from kindergarten right to the end of secondary school, student discipline, systemic racism, and there are some others. Today's presentation will really focus more directly on streaming and systemic racism. There's a direct correlation between culturally relevant pedagogy and streaming, culturally relevant pedagogy and systemic racism. And the correlation is when we choose to de-stream, when we have a program anchored in culturally relevant pedagogy, the chances of students being successful are much greater. We can er begin to eradicate systemic racism when we look at the field of education from a culturally responsive lens. So while today's conversation touches all of these areas in some way, we're most specifically speaking about the two areas highlighted in red. It's also important for us to position that this conversation is for everyone. Whether you have visibly racialized students in your school or not, 
Racism and systemic racism lives in your building. This goes for all of the human rights protected grounds, uh, which we will speak about a little bit more later. So whether you have students who are experiencing poverty or not in your school, and of course, poverty is not necessarily visible, so you may not know, classism still exists in all classrooms unless we challenge it. So all of these systems are alive and well, and we're encouraging you today to think about this conversation as relevant for every child. It's not just about race, not just about class, not just about gender. If we can move to the next slide. So we have an activity here that we will give you about five to 10 minutes to engage in after we look at it, a, a video together. Um, this video really talks about the history of schooling in Ontario, and we are grateful to Jason Toe, who is a, an educator in the Toronto District School Board for producing this very small but powerful clip. And we're asking you, as you watch the video, to think about what the video either affirms or challenges in your current thinking about schooling. And I want to go back to something that I said earlier, that we all have a personal philosophy. We may not call it a philosophy, but it's just what we believe. So what does this video affirm or challenge about your actual belief about schooling? And we know that you are at schools engaging in this professional learning together. So after, we would ask that you work in small groups as your principal sets up for you to, ha to have that conversation collectively. We'll play the video for you now, and then you'll have an opportunity to debrief. Ravon, um, we can't hear it. So I'm just going to ask you to unshare and reshare and make sure you just click that um, button. Perfect. Thank you, Ramon. We're new to team. Okay. When you hit share, also press that button. Okay, let's try this again. What is academic streaming, and what is its history in Ontario? Well, academic streaming is the practice of separating students into distinct schooling pathways based on their perceived ability. Streaming in Ontario can be traced back to the origins of schooling in the mid-19th century, when education, originally created solely for the colonial elites, was richer and more advanced than what the general working class later received. Academic streaming as we know it today has roots firmly in the education system of post-World War II Ontario. The Hope Commission of the early 1950s promoted ability grouping and the building of special education schools. In 1961, three educational streams were created and hundreds of vocational schools were built across Ontario to develop the workforce and accommodate the children of the baby boom, particularly those deemed with lesser ability. However, it became clear that these vocational schools were dead-end programs. In Toronto, these schools consisted almost entirely of students from racialized, working-class, or single-parent families. With a graduation rate of only 20%, and without adequate preparation for apprenticeship programs, enrollment declined significantly after only 10 years. By the early 1980s, a new secondary school curriculum was created with courses at three difficulty levels. With streams essentially still intact, along with hundreds of vocational schools still in existence across Ontario, students from marginalized backgrounds continued to be encouraged to attend lower streamed programs. A government commissioned report in 1988 recommended de-streaming to combat increasing dropout rates. Most school boards began de-streaming though in 1993. 
Although many teachers felt frustration and a lack of professional support during this de-stream period, a Toronto Board of Education study found that de-streaming led to moderately positive results for student attendance and achievement. However, when a new government was voted in, the education system was restreamed in 1999 into academic, applied, and essentials programming. While it was never intended for the structure to divide students along lines of ability and disability, class, and race, this was exactly the result. So in your group, as defined by your principal, we would ask you to go back to the placemat. On the placemat, there's a task, it's called task two, it's on the right side of the first page, and there are two questions we're asking you to think about with your groups. First, what evidence is there in the video and in your current context that schools are not designed for and don't facilitate the success for all students? Second, what in the video affirms or challenges your current thinking about schooling? So we'll ask you to pause the video and engage in a five to 10 minute discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to work in groups and to really think about some of these very big and complex questions. I imagine the conversations may have gone well over 10 minutes and even brought some feelings of discomfort when we think about who has benefited and who has not from the system of education that's currently in place. Some of the some of the evidence that you may have noticed in the video, and I will tell you, um, I've watched it a number of times, and each time I learned something a little bit different. But one thing that Jason told points out is that education was originally conceived for the elite. He also points out that streams can be traced back to the origins of schools in the mid 19th century. He talks about the 1950s in education in Ontario is a point where streaming was firmly entrenched in Ontario's education, where ability groups and special education were intentionally separated. The separated children by ability and special education was in its own category. In, in the 1960s, we had different streams such as arts and science, as well as business and commerce, science and technology, and we had vocational schools. And there are actually a few boards that still have vocational schools. And they were designed for young people that had a lesser ability. How much of this still exists now is something that we need to think about. We also learned from the video that vocational schools were seen as dead end programs. And they were almost completely comprised of racialized working class and single parent families. And as we moved into the 80s and 88 and then into the 90s, different types of streams emerged, but the data tells us the same students in terms of demographics and identity were streamed into the bottom stream. We're also hoping you had an opportunity to discuss like, what did this make you say, yeah, I knew that? Or what did it really challenge in terms of your thinking? We want to move into, before Ramon talks to you about what does culturally relevant pedagogy have to do with the construction of schooling? Or what is the relationship between the current data of who suffers most in public education and culturally relevant pedagogy there are some common understandings in, term of in terms of some terminology that we would like to share with you. So on the next slide, and this is an activity that, that, as I mentioned earlier, you might choose to engage in if you have time above and beyond the 75 minutes. We're not going to take the time to do it now. If you do have the extra time, you may want to give your staff some time 
to quickly jot down what they think the terms equality, equity, Eurocentrism, dominant group, and discrimination mean to them, if you have an opportunity, and then move through the slide, and we'll move through them with you. There is a task three, so that's a task you can do only if you have additional time. And then, Ramon, if you continue to flip through the slide, we have a definition on equality and equity. You can continue to the next slide. As well as Eurocentrism, dominant group, and discrimination. Um, you may want to take some time and go through those definitions if you have additional time. Otherwise, we're going to move into um, the next section on culturally responsive pedagogy. Thank you, Allison. Um, I'm going to direct everybody just to look at your placemat for a moment. Um, and we are going to be, be referencing the provocation for this section, which is really what do I know and understand about culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy? It's a, it's a phrase that's been floating around the province for some time now. Um, and there's some history in terms of the work being done um, through OISE and the, the culture as uh, the Center for Urban Schooling. Uh, and there's also the, the ministry capacity building series that many of you may have come across on culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy. So we want you to take a moment and think about this term culture as culture is really at the center of, of culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy. And as, as Allison, as you were setting the context for us to think about what are some of the challenges in education and the history behind streaming, for example, and which populations have been better served by our historical models of education and which populations have been marginalized um, or oppressed within the education system. While we set the context on those challenges, the good news is that there are many pedagogies of possibility, that there is research that have been done in numerous contexts. Uh, of course, a lot of the re uh, research in the, in the coming out of the States, but also right here in Ontario and in Canada, looking at how do we begin to address systems of oppression that operate in schooling to remove possibilities for students. And what you see in front of you are just some of the frameworks that are beginning to address some of these inequities. And we just referenced uh, some, some theorists here um, besides some of these, these, these theories. And these are some of the theorists and frameworks that you may want to look more closely at and deeper at. It's a lifelong learning, I think. Uh, for all of us as we begin to sort of think about the possibilities in education. Some of you may have done some some um, work around inclusive education, uh, settler, settler colonialism, around the idea of intersectionality that we've talked about, uh, feminist pedagogy. These are all frameworks and that have been used to really critique the dominant experience within education. And um, really want to draw your attention to, as we think about this, this idea of that Benita Love uh, talks about in her book. Uh, her book is called, We Want to Do More, or We Can Do, or We Need to Do More Than Survive. And uh, she talks about the idea that theories are really important because they help us to understand what we are currently seeing in education. And without the lens to understand the marginalization, then it leads to stereotyping. It leads to a reinforcement of the status quo. So we're going to focus our conversation around uh, culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy. And we landed here uh, for a number of reasons, one of them being that there is some significant research within Ontario around the implementation of culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy. And I'm referencing uh, some work done by Murray and uh, Karen Murray and Nicole Westburns in their work 
the equity continuum, which I'm sure many of you have, have seen. It's a red uh, booklet that really helps schools to think about uh, what are the, the structures within their school that need to be considered and challenged in order to create a more equitable schooling experience for all students, particularly those who have been historically uh, marginalized. And Ramon, I just wanted to note, when you, if you could go back to that slide, that the theorists that we have named there, they're just ones that we have utilized. It's not an exhaustive list by any means, but these are some of the theorists that have resonated with us as we have done um, our work and many that have led um, some of the thinking uh, across the problem. Thanks, Allison. So we wanna give you a moment just to think about this word culture. And when you hear this word culture, what comes to mind? So there is a space on your placemat. If you could take a moment uh, and jot down some ideas and we'll give uh, two to three minutes. So we're, we're asking you to pause the video at this point and then we'll come back and debrief. So we imagine that although culture is a, a term that comes up often uh, in conversations that people will have very different ideas and understandings of this concept of culture and that when you hear the word based that depending on your own background depending on your own experiences different things may come to mind here are some things that may have come up in your conversations or on your placemat what you're seeing on the left is similar to uh, what was in our first activity when we talked about identity. These are identities uh, that are connected to the prohibited grounds, uh, age, ancestry, gender, sex, gender identity, etc. These are all things that connect to culture, that there can be culture connected to the different social identities that we live and experience. So when we think about culture, what's important is to note the breadth or the, the breadth of culture, that it's not just what often comes to mind, I think for, for some people sometimes is race or ethnicity. That when we go to the grocery store and they, they say there's a cultural section of the grocery store that you know <laughs> there's a particular connotation to that and it is non-white, it's non-European, it's non-Western. Uh, but culture is, is, as you can see, and as we can think about much more uh, than race and ethnicity. So what we often invite people to do when we're, when we're starting with this foundation of thinking about culture and moving into culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy is to examine the list and think about which ones you share with your students, which ones, uh, in which ones you may differ, and as the provocation uh, earlier said, what does this all have to do with uh, teaching and learning? And what might this have to do with achievement? What impact might it have when a student's lived experiences, their culture, their ways of knowing, being, communicating are accepted, valued, affirmed, engaged, within the schooling context. What impact does that have on achievement? What impact does it have when those things are not affirmed or valued or acknowledged within schooling? One of the theorists, theorists that uh, I know Allison and I have been uh, reading lately and, and in our school board, we've been doing some work around is this book, A Cultivating Genius uh, by Goldie Muhammad. And Goldie Muhammad really looks at this idea of culture from a literacy sort of perspective and she she talks about historically responsive uh literacy we can kind of see the book yeah that's good <laughs> thank you <laughs> um you can see it has lots of tabs because we've been <laughs> taking notes um goldie uh dr muhammad does talk about culture and i'll give you a moment to read um what's on the slide here So what's, what, what stands out to me, one of the things that stands out is, is this idea about, you know, again, valuing, how do we bring value to the various cultures 
um, as opposed to deficit approaches and thinking. Right. And, and I know that many of you will be familiar with some of the deficit uh, thinking and conversations that might come up in schools as I'm a principal in a school and working with with staff and students. I know that sometimes when a culture is unfamiliar to us, you know, it can lead to deficit thinking around what are the capacities around certain families? What are the capacities uh, within certain communities? Uh, what are our assumptions and bias and stereotypes around parenting, around uh, value of education, etc. So um, when we think about uh, culture, it's something that we really need to to value what different cultures bring and it, and it and it's a lifelong learning as I mentioned before in terms of um, our own interrogating our own assumptions and biases. Lats and Billings is one of the theorists that we are going to lean on heavy, heavily as we talk about cult, culturally responsive pedagogy. She has an article that's that's called uh, culturally relevant pedagogy, but that's just good teaching. And I think you're as we as we go through some of the details around, you know, what strategies teachers are employing when they're looking at culturally relevant uh, uh, pedagogy. You're gonna you're you're gonna bring meaning to that title about well that's just good teaching because you're gonna notice some things that you've tried in your own practice or that you've seen in the classrooms uh, that uh, you collaborate with. Enid Lee talks about the desire to do what it takes to get students to achieve, to induce their genius, and I think it's important to start with acknowledging that at the foundation of culturally responsive and relevant pedagogy as a response to oppression and marginalization is this asset based thinking. This understanding that all students have genius, that all communities have genius, and it is our role as educators to induce that genius, to pull it out of them. And that when we see students not achieving at to the level that we, we expect, that we need to identify what are the systemic barriers and then challenge ourselves to to understand identify understand and remove those barriers and, and ramon if i can just add um when enid lee wrote about this uh in this particular article there was an acknowledgement that our system has given us evidence that we don't believe in student genius this is why streams exist this is why some students just they don't get to grade level because they have these other reasons in our mind why they should not have achieved it. But Enid Lee is saying students are geniuses and we have to do what it takes for them to get to at least the provincial standard. I remember when I became a principal, I did a staff meeting and I said my expectation in the school is all students must be at reading level. And I had a staff member who came up to me not you know not to um argue with me but as a genuine authentic question and she said Alison do you really believe all students can achieve the provincial standards and I said yes she said like every student and I said yes and I, I re reminded her that you know there's very few people in any school boards in Ontario very few a very small percentage that don't have the cognitive ability to achieve a provincial standard and, and things like, oh, they come from uh, a vulnerable population in terms of economics. So that doesn't matter. So I think what's important is we work in a system that doesn't actually believe in that quote. And as part of us, as, as on us as leaders in buildings and teachers in buildings and education workers in buildings to induce the genius, but also to interrogate what do we believe? Do we really believe that every child can perform a provincial standard and if not why not thank you Ramon. yes thank you and let's acknowledge that if we don't believe it we can't make it happen so uh, that is the starting point so we really do have to interrogate our beliefs around uh, learning and intelligence and neuroplasticity and how the brain uh, you know functions so that's an important part of this work as well so this 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 pedagogy really asks us to look at the links between culture. And as we've been discussing culture in terms of who we are 
and pedagogy, how we teach. So this is a quote from um, B. Davis, a, a book called How to Teach Students Who Don't Look Like You. Um, and I'll give you a minute to read the quote. As I was conducting uh, interviews uh, today for a couple positions at, at, at my school, uh, I noticed that a lot of candidates were uh, really strong with the importance of knowing their students, getting to know their students. I think what we will continue to push in our thinking around this is the multiple identities that students hold and how all of those identities need to need to be valued and accepted within school and the fact that it's not just knowing our students it is what do we do with the knowledge of who our students are and this pedagogy invites us to to make that the foundation in terms of planning and teaching and learning and how did this all uh, come to be so just want to tell you a little bit of a story about gloria ladson billings research around our culturally relevant pedagogy and what she was doing was spending time with some teachers in spaces where historically the students hadn't done well they were they were they were spaces with predominantly in her case racialized students predominantly low income communities uh, where those barriers of classism and racism they hadn't found ways to overcome so that those racism, the racism and classism did not impact their ability to achieve within school. So she, she spent some time in these spaces where these teachers were actually same populations where students were historically not doing well, but these, these pockets of teachers and their classroom who were having phenomenal success with the same de demographic in the same group. And she was wondering, well, why? What's going on? And at first she's looking at this data and she can't, she can't pinpoint it. They all sort of, you know, they obviously have, they have different uh, curricular tools and materials they're using. They had some different strategies they were using. They had different passions that they were engaging within the classroom. And she couldn't see the connection uh, between these different teachers. But as she started to look at the data, and started to tease it out a bit and look a little deeper, she found three tenants that kind of emerged. And the three tenants were academic success, cultural competence, and critical consciousness. So what do these things offer? What do these tenants offer? Academic success is this idea that everybody, to Allison's point, everybody is going to achieve. What you told your, st your staff, that there is academic rigor, that there's no excuses. While we, for sure, we acknowledge, you know, what different families and students are going through, that that doesn't mean that we lower the expectation or the bar. Uh, growth is expected, and the job of the educator is to do whatever it takes to, to uh, facilitate the growth. So this would be through some of the traditional or more uh, dominant things that we might talk about, like um, success criteria and learning goals and differentiated instruction and universal design for learning. All of those things were present within this, the, the classroom. Precise and consistent assessment as for and of um, learning. And again, a uh, overwhelming commitment to do whatever it takes. And in some cases, this was many phone calls in the evening, visits uh, you know, to, to, to homes, um, collaborating with community organizations uh, to make sure that all students were able to achieve the uh, at academic standard. But these tenants don't operate in isolation. So some people might stop there, but without these other tenants, they weren't seeing the same level of success. So the second one is cultural competence. And we've been talking a lot about culture. And so again, the, the, the starting point was an asset based approach to families and communities, knowing that when when students come 
in kindergarten, they already come knowing some, some things. And where they get that from is they get that from their families. They get that from their communities. And so these teachers acknowledged the strengths in different families and communities and pulled on those strengths when thinking about teaching and learning and programming. So they use students' cultures as a vehicle for learning. And conversation around those identities that we, that we began with today, your own identities, that those were a part of the conversation in the classroom. It wasn't an experience like I had um, when I was talking to you about my, my schooling experience. It wasn't until grade 10 that I really had an opportunity to do uh, an assignment that was connected to my own um, identity and, and, and history. Uh, when I did an assignment on uh, the African presence in, in the Americas before uh, the arrival of Columbus. Um, so, and that, you know, so these teachers, what they were doing is that didn't start in grade 10. <laughs> that started uh, from, from the beginning in terms of acknowledging what students' identities were and, and creating space for those in the classroom. And, and when I talk about this or when we talk about this, it's important to acknowledge that we're not talking about essentializing. We're not talking about this idea that, oh, I have three South Asian students in my classroom, so therefore we're going to do a unit on uh, Mahatma Gandhi uh, and, and the students will automatically be engaged because they're South Asian. It is back to um, this point about getting to know uh, who your students are, what their passions are, what their interests are, what their modes of communication are. Um, where race and culture may play a factor in that, but there's also going to be other of those cultural factors, you know, like like uh, gender, language, all sorts of things that may play play in. So the last one, and again, remembering that I don't really want to say the last one because these all work um, intertwined, is this idea around critical consciousness. This idea that the, the work in the classroom had meaning. It had to tie to students' understandings of the world that they lived in, to students' understandings of issues of justice and injustice and equity that exist within their communities. You know, when there are issues around policing of particular communities, that is was the curriculum. When there are issues around access to clean water, that is part of the, cur the curriculum. That students found purpose in the work. And uh, Goldie Muhammad talks about this. Dr. Muhammad also talks about this, that this was the, the this was the literacy. Literacy was engaging in the socio-economic political realities of, of students and families and being able to critique the norms and values and injustices that students are seeing uh, in their context. So these three things uh, working together in terms of culturally relevant pedagogy and when those three things were engaged in different ways with different uh, different teaching styles, the magic happened. So um, what does this look like on the ground? What does this look like in, in, in concrete ways? So we're going to move into our last section and reminding you that, you know, please do take an opportunity to pause the video. If you'd like to talk about those three tenants a little bit more, make a personal connection to what you already know about those tenants, uh, what might have been new for you, uh, what you might want to build on or think about a little bit more. And when you're ready, we will talk about operationalizing CRP. How do we put it actually into practice? We've sent you a tool along with the presentation. This tool is a summary of the research. So this work by Morris and Attell looked at the classroom based research around culturally relevant uh, pedagogy and what's been happening in different classrooms. Again, what are teachers actually doing? Because, you know, in schools, when we talk about this theoretical framework, people want to know the theory is important, but they want to know, OK, what what do, like what am I what do I actually do in my classroom to implement this? 
And so this tool that we've sent to you to look at has a number of different strategies that fall under the three tenants. What we're inviting you to do is to take a moment and look at these strategies. And we're going to provide 10 minutes uh, for this activity. So individually, we're asking you first, when you look at the strategies, to highlight, pick one color and highlight the strategies that you feel have some, you have some familiarity or competence with. And perhaps we're inviting you to look at all tenants, because uh, you know what. To Allison's point in the beginning, in terms of pu pushing our learning edge, one of the things that can happen is we go to the familiar, so we we stick in a tenant that we think is maybe easier to access or seems to make more sense to us. We we like to invite you to look at all tenants and maybe see if there are some connections you can make in terms of familiarity. And then the second part of this is to choose another color and to highlight two or three strategies that you feel might be your next move and might form an inquiry question uh, for you. So we're going to give you a few minutes to do that, five minutes to do that individually, and then we're inviting uh, administrators to facilitate another five minutes where you can share with an elbow partner and discuss and provide feedback to each other. Okay, welcome back everybody. Hopefully you've had some, some fruitful discussions with your colleagues around some things that excite you in terms of possibilities, some strategies that you might want to explore further. You may have also ident have identified some of those strategies that maybe mm, this one doesn't really fit with my particular teaching style or you know there may be some policies uh, within your school or school board that might prevent you from from engaging in some of them like the, I think there was one around ho regular home visits and you know you might take that up in different ways within your personal context but hopefully you did find something that you could think about in terms of your next move and and really what we want to get to here now is the action the piece about what will we do to implement CRP within our particular context whatever our role is. So we're going to engage what we are calling here is a three, two, the three, two, one of CRP. So we're inviting you in this final activity to think about three new understandings about CRP or ideas that were reinforced throughout uh, this presentation. And we're, we're referencing the placemat. There is space on your placemat to record those three new understandings or ideas that were reinforced. We'd also like you to think about two actions you will take to further implement CRP and two supports you will need. So we are asking you to make a commitment. And there is some, um, and we'll position, Allison and I are very passionate about this, we'll position that there is urgency around this work. When we look at the trends that Allison uh, referred to in the beginning, when we think about the populations that continually are underserved within within our our schools and school boards, uh, there is urgency to take action, and it's not enough for us to say, "Well, you know, I'm I'm not quite comfortable, or I don't know where to start." We need to all start somewhere, and we need to support each other um, to to begin some actions and then to think about next steps. So we're asking you to identify those two actions today that you'll take as well as the supports you'll need. And those supports might need, might mean a colleague to partner with. It might mean I need to do some reading or I need to do some research alongside, not wait, not do the research and wait to take action, but do some research alongside the action that I'm, I'm, I'm exploring. Um, it, might need, it might mean I need to connect with somebody outside of my school. Uh, community organizations and again uh, still owning the work and and being careful to and I'm just going to mention this because sometimes we we position that okay my the work that I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in an expert to come and talk about this uh, with my students 
Um, but we are the front line. We are there with the students every day. We are the ones building the relationships. We are the ones uh, that are responsible for their care and their education. So we need to be at the center of the work. I'm just going to position that. And lastly, um, to, we're inviting you to think about one way that you will measure the impact of your inquiry on, vulner on vulnerable groups of students. So I'm just going to reference how important it is um, to do the measuring and thinking about impact. When we did uh, some CRP inquiry work uh, in our school board, and we did a few different inquiries, one around um, black students, one around students uh, from the Middle East, one around Portuguese speaking students. It was amazing when we had the data to then go back and say, when we were trying these different actions within the school, what was the impact on both student engagement and, and sense of belonging, but then also on achievement. Um, and looking at those two things in tandem so that we're not just saying, well, students feel more comfortable and safe and they feel like they belong in the school. That is absolutely important. And so is achievement in tandem with that, right? That, that every student achieving provincial standard or above. So this is our invitation uh, to you. Uh, is to spend a few moments at this point. Uh, we're going to give maybe 10 minutes, whatever you have uh, within within your day. This is the crux, I think. Allison, if there's something you want to add in terms before we, we send them off uh, to do some of the action planning. Uh, no, just to um, to reinforce that your action should um, impact an instructional strategy. So your action might be how do we uh, have guided reading groups from a culturally responsive space when you're thinking about content, like how, what many people you do guided reading, what are the texts that we are using? Are they reflective of the lived reality of the students? Because if they are, the students will do better. So really think about this as Ramon said, it's not somebody coming in and presenting, it's part of your instructional practice. How are you delivering math? from a culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy. What are you, how are you differentiating using UDL, spiraling the curriculum, all from a culturally, a culturally relevant space? So we just want to leave you with this 10 to 15 minutes. Even if you're over time, we encourage you to use the time uh, to create your plan. Um, depending on the direction from your administrator, they may want you to, to hand this plan in so that you can continue this work as a school community because this is uh, just the beginning point. And with that, we just want to close with a quote. And the quote is from Gloria Ladson Billings. It's also on your placemat, which is all instruction is culturally responsive. The question is to which culture is it currently oriented? And with that, we say thank you so much for uh, engaging in this uh, critical but necessary work. And uh, we wish you well as you begin a new school year. Many blessings to you, everybody. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much on behalf of all of us, um, Alison and Ramon. And I really marvel at how you've managed to capture so much information from the history of how streaming started to how it's relevant for everybody and how you know how practical strategies can be implemented uh, across all classrooms. So kudos to both of you for, for being able to cover that breadth and scope of information. Um, you know, and, and what sort of many, many points really struck with me, but I was also thinking about uh, the very simple statement that you know culturally responsive and relevant pedagogy is just at its core, just good teaching. Right, so it's not an extra. It's not that you have to be vogue to do this work, or that suddenly it's become the flavor of the year in 2021. But that it's really foundational and fundamental to good teaching. So I really thank you for for reminding us of that. Um, and as you were speaking about, uh, you know, how it connects to well-being and achieving, um, it really sort of kept coming back to me that, like I said, we started off by saying, as a board, we stand for supporting all students to achieve believe and belong. And if that's what we want to do, culturally responsive and relevant pedagogy 
is nothing but the path to get there, right? So thank you for making those connections for us. I really appreciate you taking the time um, and helping us and giving us uh, practical strategies. And I'm sure there'll be lots of great discussions uh, during the PA day um, as we continue to embark on this work and we've done some work and it, it's our hope that we will continue um, on this path. So really a heartfelt thank you on behalf of all of us to both of you. I also wanted to take a moment to thank uh, you know, all the participants, all the educators in their various, various roles for engaging in this conversation. We know it's been a tough year. We know it's going to be uh, an interesting year. I don't want to prejudge, but I know and I hope and pray that it'll be a good year. Um, but I know at what a critical point uh, all staff in schools are. So I want to really thank everybody for taking the time to engage in this conversation. And truly, again, for everybody's commitment to student well-being and achievement, to me, that's what it demonstrates when we take the time to engage in this conversation. Um, thank you and uh, wishing everybody a wonderful uh, and safe back to school year and much success and laughter and happiness again and joy as we get back to our schools. Thank you and uh, we will stay in touch. <laughs>